Okay, once again, thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us this evening. Um, uh, the uh, program is, I was starting to say, this is a, a program, our guest tonight is Dean Memminger, who's a longtime anchor at, I won't say how long, I'll let him say that, <laughs> uh, for New York One News. Um, and uh, we, I had extended an invitation to Dick, uh, to, De, to, De, uh, to Dean, um, and uh, it just so happened you had mentioned that earlier in the summer you had done a, uh, a special at uh, New York One, so I think it's a good timing to do this kind of a conversation. But well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Dean, um, how you got into the business, where you're from, and we'll, we'll take the 90 second bio, okay? Yeah, well, I'll do that very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I'm a Bronx boy. I'm a New York City boy, born in Harlem. Uh, raised in the Bronx and uh, you know I really consider myself a New York City kid and I'm a storyteller of course I'm a journalist and a reporter but I really consider myself a storyteller and uh, my big TV break I was doing radio for a little while when I first got out of college went to Pace University in Westchester County my big break for TV actually came at Lehman College at uh, BronxNet TV public access right there on the cable of Lehman and I've been at New York One now uh, last month actually marked 23 years. Started as the Bronx reporter, uh, but now I am an anchor and the criminal justice reporter. So dealing with the police, the courts, and criminal justice policy. Okay. Um, going back a little bit to your, uh, to your early days, um, what was it about journalism that attracted your attention? What did you feel drew you to want to be that kind of a storyteller? Well, I th it all really started for me with uh, joining the college's radio station because I, I love the music and I still do today, love doing music profiles. So I was actually a DJ there, you know, the spinning records, playing music on the campus. And then the opportunity came to become the news director of the uh, college radio station. And I did that and fell in love with it, started doing internships at New York City uh, news stations and radio stations and one thing led to another and here I go all these years later it goes by like this uh, for those of you who are in your teens or maybe early 20s who may be taking this course. Mm -hmm. I remember in your early days uh, you said you started in radio which you know was dear to my heart um, and uh, uh, you um, were doing news at a diverse set of radio stations but mm -hmm. primarily i was familiar with your work on hip-hop and r&b stations and i think that introduced you to popular culture early on in your career did that have anything to do with um the way that you brought the news to the masses and the news to people did it affect your style or anything like that i mean i, I worked at what used to be called kiss fm 98.7 kiss fm and then you know years ago they merged with wbls so that was an urban station a black station a music station but they had a very strong news department with ann tripp the late bob slade who was my mentor and joe bragg so that was unheard of you had a music station with three news people and on Sundays, they had news and public affairs shows. So that's where I trained. And uh, that's how I got to know a lot of the people who are in charge of New York City uh, today. And that was 25 years ago when they were just coming up. Um, but now, you know, they're all powerful city leaders and uh, big names across the state, in fact, mm -hmm. and maybe the country. So that's where it started for me in terms of covering the news from a Black perspective. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't tell the news straight, but there's always a perspective. And, you know, if you're covering the news of New York City and you're African-American and you're from the boroughs, you understand certain certain stories perhaps better uh, than someone who is from, you know, way out on Long Island or upstate or, or Rockland coming into the city to cover the stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's get right into that then. That's a good segue into the radio term segue. Good segue into uh, the conversation tonight. Um, back in June um, at New York One, you folks did a special um, that uh, w w it basically dealt on the on the heels of the racial protests. And um, can you talk a little bit of how yeah, this is following the death of George Floyd 
and the and the protests. Can you tell us a little bit about that project and how that came about? Yeah, that was for uh, New York One and uh, Spectrum News, and we called it the Journey to Equality. I mean, this was after all of the protests had really kicked up and they were in full steam across the country, but especially here in New York. And we thought it was important to have all of the Black anchors or Black reporters that are often seen on New York One get together and tell stories uh, from the way we were seeing them and allow us to lead the conversation as African-Americans because this movement that we've seen this past summer and this year was all about what you know we know as Black Lives Matter. And what that meant was that for us, that plain, plain and simple, Black Lives Matter, it's not something political. It means that we wanted equality and fairness when it came to policing. And as prominent news people who are well known across the city, if the mayor walked in the room, uh, the police commissioner, he would know all of us. And, but yet we had this feeling that, you know what, this is not just about other black people, it's about our families as well. We are sometimes fearful of police as well and what could happen if you had an interaction with a police officer. So we said, you know what, Let's do these stories with our voices leading the way. Uh, let's take a little bit uh, of a look at that special. This is about a minute and a half into the highlight, uh, highlight reel from that. So let's uh, give a, 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 sh a quick, this is about uh, two and a half minutes of that special and then we'll come back and talk about it. Yeah, Errol, you make a very good point. And speaking of sea change, it was an honor for me to talk to the mothers of the movement. I only got to talk to two of them, Gwen Carr and Valerie Bell, but Dean, you developed a relationship with Katiadu Diallo after her son was killed in the Bronx. Tell us about your experience covering that notorious incident. Yeah, that was Amadou Diallo who was killed in 1999 in the Bronx on Wheeler Avenue. Uh, cops went to his block, say they were looking for something. Something They fired at him 41 times, hitting him 19 times. Young African man from West Africa, standing in his own doorway, didn't have a gun, only in the wallet and his keys. They said it was a tragic mistake. He was killed. I was there that morning when it happened, and then I was there many days on that block, even when his mother, Kadia Tudialo, arrived from West Africa, screaming her son's name, Amadou, Amadou. And that just rings in my ear right now. Uh, that happened 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. And she stays in contact because she wanted to make a difference. She didn't want this sort of thing to happen to anyone else, but of course it has. And I've become close with so many other mothers and parents who have lost uh, their children to police violence. And they want to continue to have their stories out there because they say it's a part of history in New York City and a part of history in this country where Police have unfortunately killed unarmed black men and women. You know, it's so interesting because it takes me back to like when I started in this business in the 70s, actually mid to late, when uh, Vietnam War protests were dying down, the Black Power Movement was dying down. Rochelle, you've been out there okay. every day covering these protesters. The intensity rivals that. It is amazing. Okay. Amazing to see. Okay, Dean, I think that that. Um, excerpt is kind of um, a good place to start our conversation here dealing with that in that immediately that was that was relatively shortly after you joined New York one I believe um, maybe a year or two something like that yes mm -hmm. um, um, how and how did you approach that story and how did you approach the mother of Amadou Diallo anyone of us that's old enough to remember that remember the horror of that that incident um, but uh, how, how is it that you approach that and how did you get to know the mother the way you described the Vamadu? I mean, you, you approach it, you know, as a story, as a journalist, you're going there to tell the story, to get the information. But, you know, it really was impactful to see Cario Tudialo arrive in New York from Africa and arrive on that block and just wail her son's name. I mean, you know, that, as you heard me say in that segment there on New York One, it still does touch me. And, and that was a case where a lot of times where 
uh, young black men are, are killed by police, there's always that conversation of, well, what were they doing wrong? Did they have a criminal history? And sometimes that's the facts of the story. But here you had a young man from Africa who was doing nothing, just standing in the doorway of his house and he was perceived as being a, a criminal, a rapist or something, and he was shot dead. Um, but I spoke to his mother time and time again over the years. And, you know, we kind of connected because she wanted to keep her son's legacy alive. And she started a foundation and she would always call me to talk to me about her son's foundation. And I thought it was worthy to continue to put his story out there as well to remind people these are the sort of things that happen. And that's why, you know, people are afraid. And, and you may have heard me mention if it was in that segment where in a lot of neighborhoods, people are afraid of the cops you know, and the criminals. And that is a heck of a way to have to live. And as a journalist, as a reporter, that's something that I have to continue to bring to the police department, no matter how much they change, how good they are in certain things, they have to remember that people are afraid and it's really up to them, the police department, to work on that, to make sure that all people feel protected and served by police officers. Mm -hmm. I, and I wanna come back to that in a, in a few minutes, but first I wanna talk about the element of empathy. Uh, you grew up in these neighborhoods. You grew up in the, in the Bronx and in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what kind of an advantage does that give to you? And advantage may not be the right word. I guess empathy is the right word mm -hmm. um, to be able to deal with these stories coming up from the streets. Not, someone coming out of Nebraska can't do this story, right? Yeah, I mean, well, what it is is that, I mean, sometimes it is an advantage, but it, it is a, it's a viewpoint, right? I don't want to say it's just a, a, a Black or a Latino or Hispanic viewpoint, but when you're from those neighborhoods, that's the viewpoint you have. And it doesn't have to be someone from Nebraska. It could be, as I mentioned, you know, someone from Westchester County mm -hmm. who, or, or Rockland or parts of Suffolk or Nassau County who grew up in more suburban neighborhoods. I'm a kid from the Bronx, you know, I, I, I took the, the train uh, to work when I first started in this uh, industry, you know, from the last stop in the Bronx all the way down the 42nd Street. You know, I, I played basketball in neighborhoods, took the bus to well, school. Well, let me, so let, was, let, let me be a little more blunt um, because you're black. I mean, simply mm -hmm. being, um, being an African-American reporting on communities that are African-American, um, it's, it's got to have an empathetic difference in terms of covering a community. Yes, so, I mean, of course, because you are a part of the community. So, you know, being black, if you're, if you're covering a black community, you're a part of that community, especially when you're from there. So you see things, what I was getting to, you see things in, in a different light. Um, for instance, the Amadou Diallo case, before that happened, I actually had a family member call me who did, just lived a few blocks away from where Amadou Diallo lived, crying because the police would constantly stop her sons and stop and frisk them. So when this happened, it wasn't like, oh, we don't understand how this could happen. No, it was like people knew that this was gonna happen because the cops were so aggressive and trying to drive down crime numbers in, in those neighborhoods, which is fine. But while you're driving down crime, we understood that you can't, you know, go after every single person and stop and frisk them, even when it came to high school and junior high school kids. So yes, you know, when, when people say the police are doing this to me, it was easy for me to believe where perhaps other reporters were saying, well, we don't understand this. Mm -hmm. What about your relationship with, um, with the cops? I mean, we, we all know as journalists that a big part of uh, being able to do your job as a journalist is to maintain those connections and those contacts and that dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, is that, I, I, well, I'm sure it's difficult to do, but how is it that you do that? Maintain that relationship with the police where they sufficiently trust you, but they understand that you're, you're not there to be their friend, you're there to report on them. How do you do that? Well, I guess trying to be as fair as possible when it comes to the stories. If there is a good story to tell, if police are doing if they're doing good work, I tell those stories with vigor and passion. But if they're doing something wrong, well, I have the same vigor and passion and they understand that. And I think most of them would say that I'm fair. I have to, you know, please shoot someone. I have to cover that. And if they're wrong in what they did, I'm there to cover it. And, and they must understand that. Um, but, 
you know, I'm not there to bash the police um, because I, I believe, yes, we do need police officers. I know there's a, a whole debate about that. But what I often say is we need good police officers in the neighborhoods, not bad police officers. And, you know, it's not political journalism. It's just really stating the facts when you've covered these sort of stories time and time again, where, uh, you know, people have been killed by police being overly aggressive or maybe not following training. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I, a recent story you did, I think at the beginning of October, which I thought was a nuanced look at the quote, it's not the defunding the police, but basically using the resources. It was about the mental health workers who were being mm -hmm. assigned to work with. If we have time, I'll play that piece a little bit later. But I thought that was kind of a nuanced piece that you may not see on channel seven or channel four. Um, mm -hmm. that you guys were able to bring to the fore. So um, uh, you've been uh, reporting on New York One and you've been very successful there. Uh, and you've seen a lot happen and a lot change uh, over the course of the years. Um, how has the relationship between the police and um, communities of color changed over that time that you've been covering it or has it not changed? I mean, I definitely think it changed. I think it's a, a better relationship than what it was 10 years ago. Um, and they have worked hard to improve that relationship, although it is not perfect, right? Uh, they will always point out, well, you have a police department of, let's say approximately 34,000 police officers and maybe another 15,000 civilians. So a police department of over 50,000 people, they will say, you know, you will always have some bad apples, but what we know is that it's, it's more than just a few bad apples if you look at the amount of police officers that get in trouble for various things um, you know, every year. But I, I do think they've worked harder. They're not as aggressive. And that's because people spoke up. Activists spoke up. Um, city council people spoke up to push back on stop and frisk. And one of the things when you talk about keeping the police department honest and from you know, people in the black and Latino communities and communities of color and poor communities. For years, they said, oh, we're not stopping and frisking people illegally. We're just doing what we have to do. It's all right. Then when it went to federal court and I was one of the few TV reporters, maybe the only one that covered the majority of the federal stop and frisk trial. Nowadays, when we had a new mayor, Bill de Blasio got in, you heard police commanders saying, oh yeah, well, maybe we did that too much, but we won't do it again. So for years they lied and said, we weren't doing anything wrong. Now, all of a sudden they're saying, yeah, we were doing it. Maybe we should have done it differently. So, you know, the relationship has changed, but you can't forget that because, you know, the police department in New York City is so powerful. It is also political. So you have to keep them, you know, on their toes and try to keep them honest. Uh, but, you know, also work with them to give you information because if they don't give you information, it's hard to get that information to right. people when it comes to stats and stuff like that. Right, um, Professor White actually, Marissa White actually had a question relating to that. And I wanna mention to everyone else, please, any questions that you might have, you can feel free to either uh, type them into the, um, the chat function and I'll be happy to pass those questions along or just raise your hand by your virtual hand by hovering <laughs> over uh, the participant area and just put the little blue hand will show up. Uh, not. They're not Democrats, but they're little blue hands <laughs> in the column and I'll, I'll call on you. But she said, do you have like, do you develop contacts, I guess, within, and, and this would be not only the police department, this would be the city council, this would be the different beats. And as the, um, uh, the uh, you cover the courts basically. So I would assume that you'd have to, to have contacts within the court systems as well. Mm -hmm. that, do you have those contacts and how do you develop them? I mean, yeah, it's just the longevity of, of it. You know, I, I've been doing this now for, I mean, it's unbelievable to think that, you know, it could be 30 years uh, very soon. So uh, when I said earlier, it's just a matter of the people who were just patrol officers or sergeant, now they are the top chiefs in the department and I've been putting them on TV for 20 years and they trust me, um, you know, if they want their message out there, they know they often have to go through me in New York One. Um, so that's how you build your contacts. But, you know, for people uh, coming up, I often say the contacts you make now, keep those phone numbers, keep those emails, 
because you may not need them now, but five, 10, 15 years from now, uh, you will need them. And, you know, people who are running for mayor, and it has happened to me, you know, I was covering them 25 years ago. So, you know, that I told people, I'm not an old man yet. I hope to get there one day, but I am getting older and I am a veteran in this business. So, you know, it, it, it's just the longevity of it. And hopefully people trust you because, you know, they're not going to come to you and give you contacts if they don't trust you. They're not going to give you information if they don't trust you. Yeah, I remember you were like in in second grade when you started with us at Bronx. <laughs> very, very, you, you, you wear it well. Uh, Kiana has a question. Uh, she's asking what journalists, either in radio or in television, do you look up to as, um, as role models? Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned a little earlier, Bob Slade, who was Bob working was wonderful. on I, I had the to him with Bob too. And Bob. Um, he uh, also, uh, you know, went over to WBLS, passed away, uh, yeah, not too long ago. He was like my radio dad, my news dad. So I looked up to him and, you know, when it comes to the inflection and delivering a story and being passionate about it, because, you know, a lot of times when you're telling stories, um, you're dealing with people's, people's lives. You know, when I deal with police officers and I talk, you talk about the mental health response, how do they respond to people with mental health? That's not just a story. That's hopefully you know, I, I, what I did, people get more information or the police stop and think and say, when we respond to someone's home and we know they're mentally ill, this ends on a good note. Um, also on TV, you know, back in the day, it would have been, you know, and that's just looking up to someone who was a powerful African-American man on Channel 7 Eyewitness News, John Johnson. You know, that was a man who, you know, I remember being a young reporter covering something at police headquarters and they tried to shut the news conference down and he yelled out, no, you're going to answer this question. And, you know, he made them answer. So not only was he, you know, very popular on TV, he was well respected. And, it's, you know, so I said, wow, I want to be like John Johnson. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, another question. This is from Victory Hester. Victory wants to know, um, how do you uh, how do you keep that level of professionalism as a journalist and um, well, the professionalism element of it when a lot of these stories hit so close to home, um, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to, um, again, in the in communities of color, when, uh, when these stories about young men being, being shot and um, the problems that it, th th they're basically close. So how do you deal yeah. with it? Well, I mean, the, the, the issue here is that, as I mentioned, you know, people in, in the communities, good people are afraid of the criminals and afraid of the cops. So I look at each story, you know, and try to remember this. Each story is different, although, you know, I need to look at the history of the story. But it's not that I look at cops as being bad and they're the ones, you know, causing all the problems, because obviously there are people, um, you know, as we take this on this day in the Bronx, horrible day you guys and I'm getting the information firsthand and breaking the news you know as I prepare to come on with zoom two young kids uh, a month old found dead in the Bronx uh, three people shot on like 157th street this evening so I know like these sort of things are happening and, and in these cases the police didn't do this so I'm covering each story you know what the police if they kill somebody right what went wrong but I'm not gonna say all cops are bad and it's not just the cops that are causing problems. And there are criminals out there as well. And, and I, I'm not gonna take the black side or the white side or the police side. I'm just really gonna try to get the truth uh, as best I can, because sometimes you don't get the whole truth when you're reporting a story and you have a deadline. Uh, but that's how I do it. And you know, I have to be honest to myself to make sure the people who are watching me that I'm giving them the best information uh, that I can. Mm -hmm. And is it okay, this is a follow-up from, from Victory, is it all right to show emotion on stories? I think it depends on the story. You don't want to break down on every story, right? But I mean, there are, are, are some stories that are, are just there. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, I don't remember, you know, crying on TV, but I may have teared up on some stories. But the special, the journey to equality, I took part in that special. But when it came on and I was sitting by myself, you know, on the sofa watching it, I, I teared up because it was powerful. You know, when you're working a story, you know, it's like I, I use this analogy, you know, when you're a reporter, it's like Thanksgiving dinner. 
maybe you're just cooking the turkey and, and you're just looking at the turkey. But when that whole table is set with the vegetables and the, the, you know, the mac and cheese or whatever it is, your rice, your desserts and your beverages, that's a whole dinner that comes together. And, and, and that looks fabulous. Just cooking the turkey, maybe you don't see it. And I say that in this sense, I'm covering my story on all of these protests. I'm speaking to the police. So I know their story, I'm not emotional about it. But when everybody's story is laid out and they're talking to victims and protesters and the whole timeline of what happened, that it became emotional to me because I, we knew that, you know, unfortunately it could be us or it could be one of our family members. And that's why we were passionate about telling the stories from our point of view, because the police may not see that. They know Dean Meminger. If I walk into police headquarters, hey, Dean, what's up? They may never think that Dean Meminger is fearful that his son or his cousin may be killed by a cop. And it's important for them to hear that from me. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here from uh, from Dr. Boston, from Nick, uh, that deer is changing, um, changing gears just a little bit. It deals with the lockdown and uh, what happened with the onset of the pandemic. Um, can you speak a little bit about the fear factor when the lockdown began? And um, I mean, uh, you probably had more detailed, specific information, but the fear was like universal. What was it like to, to um, be an anchor, be a journalist and be in the field in the streets um, as the pandemic basically mm -hmm. took its grip. Yeah, I mean, uh, for a lot of us, uh, we actually pulled back from being on the streets. You know, I have a whole studio in my house uh, that I actually anchor from at times if I need to, uh, not always going into the studio, uh, though I do go into the studio now. Um, eventually we started to go back onto the street. Some of us, we decided not to. Um, in my case, I have a household with four generations. So we had, uh, you know, a person who was a senior living with me. So I had to be very cautious about going out into crowds. Um, but we were telling the stories and we were getting out there. And once again, when you talk about it impacting you, I had people very close to my family who died from COVID-19. So once again, this was not about, oh, just covering a story. It was the reality that I wanted to stay alive. I didn't want to die. And we had, you know, people very close to my family who we considered family members dying, people who I covered for years, Jim, you know, and you're finding out they're dying from COVID. So this was, this was real. And uh, so we had to tell the stories. We had to get the information out there. And even today, right, continue to push. Hey, it's not over. We're hearing that. The second wave for New York City may be here. So, you know, you, you have to report these stories as accurately as you can, although there's a lot of confusion still out there. Mm -hmm. um, were you considered an essential worker? Um, yeah, in that? We, okay. we were considered uh, essential workers and, you know, they were supposed to allow us to cross any lines to go downtown or wherever you were and travel around and, and, you know, in essence, we were, we were getting the information out there. Yeah, we have spoken about this in other uh, seminars and dialogues, Jim, where of course there's a lot of social media out there. Everybody's on the blog, they have a YouTube, a Twitter, Instagram, but you know, really when it, you're getting information, you want to get it from people who have the contacts, who have the sources, who have the integrity, not just somebody popping up, you know, on Instagram saying any old thing or because they can get video. Uh, you really want to dial into people who are knowledgeable of, of covering these sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get to that uh, in a minute, the, the whole element of multi-platform and social media and being a journalist with that. But Adrienne has a question. She, um, I, think, I think it's a she, anyhow. Uh, Adrienne asks, how different is criminal justice journalism from other types of journalism, like investigative? And how are you protected from any danger or, or any types of personal threats that you might get involved? <laughs> well, you know, as a criminal justice reporter, um, I'm often doing a lot of investigative reporting. Uh, but in terms of criminal justice, it's a lot of uh, policy stuff I'm dealing with. When I was the Bronx reporter, you know, I was on the street crime scenes dealing with a lot of the local police commanders from the precincts in the Bronx. But now 
as criminal justice, I'm dealing with a lot of the top chiefs and the police commissioner on a, on a daily basis about issues, about policies and really getting answers from them. Um, you, you know, covering these sort of stories, I remember years ago, I did a story on a, a young teenage kid who uh, I think he was, uh, I think he was a Puerto Rican kid. And the reason I mentioned that is because he had these hazel eyes and he had accused the police of slapping him and his eye was bloodshot. And uh, you know, the, the line I use is hazel eyes are bloodshot. And what, whatever cop did that, I guess ended up in trouble. And he actually saw me in my neighborhood and recognized me and started yelling, it's because of you, I'm on modified duty. And I go, holy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this cop is gonna come after me. Um, but eventually, you know, he calmed down. Oh, I know it's not you, it's the politicians who called you. Um, so I always think about that. I, you know, I say I cover criminals, I cover crazies and I cover crazy cops. You know, if I put one of these crazy cops on TV who did something wrong, they may want to come after me. Or, you know, maybe it's a cop who didn't do anything wrong, but I'm telling the story. And I've had that where I know people for a long time and they get wrapped up in, in some sort of uh, controversy and I have to cover the story. You know, they're not happy about it. So I tell a lot of them, hey, I have to cover these stories and, and, I, and I will. Uh, uh, you're cut off or is that me? No, I don't hear you, Jim. That's me, that's me. Okay. I was coughing, sorry. My cough button was in and Adrian is he, I apologize to Adrian. Uh, Brittany has a question. Um, you, uh, you've been in the field for a while, okay? Uh, what are the biggest changes in reporting and in how reporting is done have you seen in the last 20 years since you've been at New York One? Mm, I think it's probably more the technology than the storytelling. Um, obviously, you know, things are just coming out as even faster, right? Like, you know, with Instagram and Twitter and that has so much power nowadays where you have to get the story out there on social media because maybe I can get it on social media quicker than I can get it on, you know, on TV, on New York One. So not only, you know, am, am I charged with getting the story on TV, I have to get it on our Spectrum News app. I have to get it on Twitter, you know, and then, you know, I have my Instagram and my Facebook. So I'm pushing it there as we talk, you know, my Twitter's popping up on my screen. Um, so that's where it has changed because it's not just, you know, oh, we got to go on TV at six o'clock and New York One has never operated that way because we're 24 hour news, but it's not just TV. It's a real push to get information on our app because they figured as, you know, a growing number of people like many of you right now, you know, you may not be turning on the TV. You're just looking at your phone. So we have to make sure we can get these stories on the phone where people are reading them, but also watching them too, because I hope people are still watching me. Do you consider yourself still to be a, a TV journalist? Or now I think, I, I like to say it's more of a multi-platform. Yeah, I mean, they call us, you know, multimedia journalists. Um, but I still consider myself a TV journalist or TV reporter and anchor at this point, um, you know, because the big question was if we're all going to these online platforms and, and social media, you know, how are people really going to see us? Like, what, how's this story going to be told? So I think the stories for now are still told the same way, except for you're just getting them across the apps. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we've spoken about this before for those of us who have put a lot of energy into this and have become successful, you know, some people become journalists because they want to be journalists, but a lot of people go on TV because they want to be successful. So, you know, there's always that financial part of this way. If I'm only going on somebody's phone or computer, you know, am I still going to be able to make the kind of money or have the kind of career uh, that I want? And, you know, we, we are still looking at that, but I believe that it will still be the same during this election, during the pandemic, all of this stuff you're watching on your phone, has actually come from a TV station with people doing it at a TV station and they're just pumping it on social media or YouTube or somewhere else. Okay, there's a question I've been saving, but uh, Professor Boston has beat me to the punch. He's come up with the question, so I'm gonna let him ask it. So Nick, go ahead and unmute yourself. I, I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna cut in on, on, uh, on anything at all. Um, Dean, hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, Pleasure to see you. Pleasure to see you too. I, I, I know your story and I know you're um, at, 
you know, sort of history with with Lehman, and I've been watching you for as long as you've been on TV too. So <laughs> I'm just I'm just as as old as you are. Uh, put it that way. But Dean, I wanted to ask you about um, the mayoral race that's heating up here in New York, and you know, there are a lot of interesting candidates. You know, Maya Wiley. Ray McGuire, Carlos Manchaca, and then, you know, sort of like the old guard, uh, Scott Stringer and so on. What do you think of this diverse field of candidates and not everybody has even declared at this point um, and how that could potentially kind of split the electorate in or pull the electorate in, in a number of different ways that formerly perhaps it might've been a bit more clear cut you know, in terms of demographics, women, African Americans, you know, Latinos, etc. What do you, what do you, what's your, what's your thought about the the race in general? I mean, I, I, I mean, the bottom line is that it's good to have that diversity in the race, and you know, candidates in there really early on. But we're a long way from election day, so we're going to see more people join, people drop off. Um, you know, we're still a very political town. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's going to work the same way it normally does. The big political parties are going to back someone and that person will probably have the most money, the most name recognition, and they'll ride on. Or, you know, you'll have two, three or four that are there that are battling each other, unless we have some candidate, progressive candidate that comes out of nowhere, you know, with the backing from across the country and they shock everyone or, you know, someone with a lot of money like, Way back, we had, uh, you know, Michael Bloomberg that very few people knew outside of, you know, him being a businessman. And then he came in and he won. Uh, but I, I think at this point, you know, it's the establishments uh, that usually get it. But I think when you have a bunch of people running and a bunch of voices out there, it's important for, you know, those who eventually make it uh, that they listen. I mean, you know, look at the, the presidential election. Look who we have you know, as the uh, presumptive winner in Joe Biden, that somebody who has been a uh, party politician for 40 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a follow up on that, as the criminal justice reporter, uh, you may have uh, a pretty interesting beat coming up in terms of uh, some criminal cases that are pending against our current president, uh, mm -hmm. because even if he pardons himself or gets a pardon, charges that a uh, no, Lehman alumni, alumna actually, uh, Letitia James, um, would be in position to, to still file charges. So we may be looking at some very interesting criminal cases coming up. Would that be something that would be in your, uh, your belly with there, your neck of the woods? Uh, po possibly, you know, it depends on sometimes you go into this mode of, well, who's available to cover the big story. So that would fall, you know, where I'm available, I'm around. Uh, usually as the criminal justice reporter, I would not do something like that because we have a whole political unit. So as well as this being a criminal justice story, it's probably a much bigger political story. So we'd have our political reporters jump in. But, you know, once again, you're talking about, you know, who has connections with the, the uh, feds and the federal prosecutors and things of that nature and what's going to go down. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, it shall we shall see because we don't know if any of these cases will move forward or if new cases will pop up. OK, um, uh, I want to uh, take a look at I just want to put another word out there that we, we do have a few more minutes to ask some questions. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. Professor White has a follow up in dealing with uh, the multi platform aspect of it, and it deals with the credibility of social media in that um, you're competing on Twitter and in other social media when you report. And I know you're extremely active on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, you, I joked with you a couple of years ago that you were the first one that did a live commentary from a moving bike uh, yeah. <laughs> as you were uh, filing uh, a, uh, I, I guess it was so, it would be considered soft news at that point. Uh, yeah. But you're a very avid user of social media. Yet, um, I think the rules are the rule. Let me ask you, are the rules different in social media in terms of getting real legitimate news as opposed to fake news? And how does that dynamic work? Mm -hmm. um, what it is, and let me move up because my uh, notifications from Twitter are popping up. <laughs> the, um, you know what, you know, it, it's rapidly changing, right? Every month or, you know, 
Every couple of months, it, it changes. Right now, Twitter is at that point where it is a legitimate you know, news outlet. People put news there, although you can you know, put your cat on or whatever you want. But a lot of people are getting their information from Twitter. So you know, even over the years, I've had to change where, I, oh, it's social media. It's you know, no big deal if I have a, you know, a spelling error. And you know, then I had to realize, man, I have to really check this because people are, you know, are watching this a lot more closely. Although, you know, it, that can happen, right? Twitter, you can't change and, and make uh, corrections, which is a little crazy. I think hopefully we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. um, but no, when when you're a news person or a news station. Yeah, your stuff has, you have to be right when you're putting it out there. It's not like, oh, it's just because it's Dean Meminger's Twitter account, I can just put any old thing. You know, I, I have to, I use it the same way. Would, would I say this on TV if I was in front of the news camera right now? And the answer is yes. So that's when I go ahead and I put it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there's a debate in the newsroom. You know, we have the newsroom, we have the digital people, the web people, the app people. And sometimes they may be nervous with, you know, retweeting something I said, or, you know, pushing it more on their app. But, you know, the way I looked at it as if, if I was in front of that camera right now live, I would say exactly what I just put on Instagram or Twitter. So in other words, you're using, you're using the same criteria for making journalistic judgments, whether it's Twitter or it's TV. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, I can put on Twitter something that is, you know, maybe just a teaser that does not have all of the information. But, you know, like the, like, like today with the unfortunate uh, situation with the two babies dead in the Bronx, I just simply put it out there, you know, breaking news, uh, two infants found, you know, dead in the Bronx, the investigation is ongoing, you know, you can do something as simple as that. Uh, but, you know, I often want to remind people because, you know, Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, whatever you want, it's so immediate and people can actually dialogue with you, right, and respond to you and go at you. So, you know, you always have that uh, thing going on where somebody wants to criticize you for your reporting. Or, and I often tell people, understand, this is social media. It's not the whole story. Why did you post that 15 seconds of video, Dean Meminger? And I'm like, because that's what I had and that's what I put out there. <laughs> okay. Um, let's, uh, as we wind things down, take a look at some of the mechanics and getting back to the same type of story. You've recently filed a piece um, dealing with a uh, breaking news story uh, in Queens uh, where the police had shot uh, a black man. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, I'm going to show the, uh, it's about a minute and a half story. We'll take a okay. look at it. It's you on scene. And then if you could talk a little bit about the background of how that happened and the mechanics of you as a reporter, how you did it. So let's take a look at that. Okay. Share my screen here. Uh, get, get all my mechanics right. Well, police are saying they did shoot a suspect multiple times this afternoon here in Springfield Gardens in Queens. And uh, right behind me, you can see it's still a very, very active scene. This happened uh, shortly before one o'clock this afternoon. Now, police are saying that this individual they were looking for, he was wanted on a warrant or even possibly wanted in connection with a past shooting, maybe even a murder. But this investigation continues now. What we are told is that cops knew where he was located and then they arrived in the area and they said while he was driving off, they tried to arrest him and he took off. Now, uh, according to people in this neighborhood, the driver of the car hit multiple cars. I actually spoke to one woman in this neighborhood on 182nd. She said the car hit her and she just thought it was an accident that the guy had turned too quickly. The next thing she saw cops chasing behind him, he ran and then she heard a number of gunshots she said she ducked for her life because she didn't know really what was going on. But once again, police say the individual was shot multiple times and killed by police. Uh, this was like a felony warrant squad or something to that nature. And police are going to give us an update a little later on as this investigation continues. But they are saying they did shoot a suspect this afternoon, killing that individual. They say he fired at cops as well, and they recovered two guns from him. But once again, this investigation is continuing. That is the very latest. In Queens, Dean Meminger, New York One. Let's go back to you. Okay, so um, give us a little of the background on that, uh, that story. Um, how did it happen? 
Well, I'm probably working on another story that day or trying to set up some stories. And then all of a sudden we get news about this shooting in Queens and they're like, okay, race out there, Dean. Let's see what's going on. We're going to get you on camera. So uh, normally I don't cover uh, those sort of scenes. I do do it, but it's not the normal thing. Like when I was the Bronx Report, I would always do that. Um, but, you know, like I said, I'm doing more policy stuff or big picture stuff. Uh, but, you know, it was an active scene. So they said, let's go out there. So I get out there. And of course, I know a bunch of cops in the area, um, you know, that I'm getting information from that no one else is getting the information from. And then, you know, I see a lady uh, standing, walking around and I'm like, what's going on? And then I come to find out, you know, she's the person that the gentleman that the cops were chasing, he crashed into her car. So she didn't want to go on camera, but she was she allowed me to get her audio and, and get the whole picture. So that, you know, that's kind of that, uh, what I call guerrilla journalism, you know? I'm just walking by myself. I have my cell phone. I'm not afraid to use my cell phone to get video and put that on TV. And, you know, so I got the information from a witness who was actually involved. And then my police sources were giving me the lowdown on everything. So by the time I get on TV, I, you know, I have it pretty much all down before the police release any information officially. But, you know, uh, people think it's all glamour and stuff. But that day I had to walk a mile because I didn't know where I was in Queens. I'm walking on the, the side of the uh, service road for the highway. All the streets are closed and, you know, walking around. So people think you just pop up. Sometimes you do pop up lights, camera, action. But a lot of times, you know, it's a, a lot of sweat and hard work goes into this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have said, what, what's Dean doing in Queens? He's yeah. <laughs> the Bronx boy. Um, okay, uh, we, we're winding down here. Um, well, first, uh, in terms of that story, now, did, did that, that get handed off to another reporter or did you get to follow up on that? I actually, I actually ended up following up on it uh, because they did hold a news conference at the local police precinct in that area. And they gave some information about how the uh, man was involved in uh, some other shootings and they were looking for him. But it ended up that this young man really had a very uh, terrible life from the time he was a young kid. So, you know, some had said, you know, they weren't surprised that he ended up on this side of the law. But, um, you know, I ended up doing that story because I went to the actual news conference and, and we wrapped it up that day. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, to wrap it up, I'm going to just simply ask you to uh, explain this. <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at that shiny outfit. I'm actually, yeah, it's November now. I have to start looking for another shiny jacket. Uh, you know, not only am I the criminal justice reporter and anchor, but I love having a good time and I cover a lot of music stuff, interview celebrities. But every year I host the New York One Spectrum News uh, Countdown Show to the New Year's Day. So it's the New Year's Eve countdown show and I always have uh, some shiny jacket or colorful jacket on. And, and that was uh, this, I guess this past, and it must've been 2019 going into 2020. We thought 2020 right. was gonna be so right. great. And you know, I can't wait to help kick 2020 out here and usher in 2021. And you can check that out by checking out your Twitter account because that's where <laughs> I got the picture from. Um, and it's, it's always fun to, uh, to see what kind of jacket Dean's going to be wearing this new yeah. year. Uh, but it's a tradition and it's, it's kind of the type of tradition that helps to create an identity for the station. And it's helped create you as a, uh, one of the cornerstones of, of New York one. You've uh, gone through uh, different ownership of the stations. And um, let me ask you that really quickly. Um, management of the stations. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you can't speak too much about uh, specifics of that, but um, is, is the ownership of stations, uh, at least in your experience, and I know you've been at New York One for such a long time, um, are you free to do your job, basically, as a journalist in uh, covering things that um, may or may not uh, affect the corporate powers that be? Um, are you pretty much free to, to be a journalist? I, I am. Yes, I am personally. Yes. Uh, because I, you know, I go into these stories and, and I'm a person that I will speak up, you know, for my story and, you know, make sure that it's important. I get it out there, but you know, companies are companies. So, you know, sometimes you have to hear their point of view as well to find out what, what they're thinking. But so far, 
I've been able to cover the stories the, the way I need to. And uh, that is important. And as you know, I often say, you know, it's a very serious job and I take it seriously and, and I, I enjoy it. Uh, but any of those who are looking to, you know, get into TV or media, radio, whatever it is, you know, definitely enjoy what you do because it is stressful and it is difficult. And if you don't enjoy it, there's no need to be in it. So as you can see, I always have a big smile on my face and, uh, you know, but when I have to be serious, I'm dead serious, but I also, you know, enjoy what I do. Well, uh, that's obvious from the way you do uh, do your reporting. You're serious when it needs to be, but um, you're one of the most familiar faces now in New York news. And uh, we're proud to have you as uh, someone with such close ties to Lehman. And you always are very, very generous with your time to come back and speak to students. And I wanna thank you for doing that again tonight. If people do have other questions, um, you can send them to me and I'll be happy to pass them along to you, Dean. And um, uh, it, feel free to keep us as, as a resource and um, we'll, we'll keep, keep you as a resource as well. So um, Dean Memminger, New York One News, originally Time Warner, New York, New, New York One News, or before, that, that's what it was in the beginning, right? Time Warner, uh, New York Yeah, One. when I came in, it was, uh, yeah, it was Time Warner Cable. Actually, I don't know if AOL was a part of it when I first came in, actually what AOL. I think Time it was, I, I, I think it was, yeah. Um, before that, News 67. Part of the Bronx program. Net, that's right. Bronx Net team. B B X N Y News, something B X N Y, like right? Um, and then News sixty seven, and uh, we're proud to call you an alum. So once again, I want to thank you very much for uh, for agreeing to be here tonight. I know you're really busy, and uh, there's a lot going on with uh, everything that's going on in the world, and your yeah. time is valuable. So thank you so much. Thank um, you Jim, for having me, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Um, once again, I'm Jim Carney. And uh, we've been talking to Dean Memminger from New York One News. And uh, with that, I'll uh, bid everybody a good evening. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you in a bit, Dean. Thanks, Dean. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Good night, everybody.